that loves numbers. And you know what? I might not have said that a year ago, but I spent the last year writing a book about how we represent ourselves online. And so, of course, I looked at visual self-representation, selfies. Um, I looked at textual self-representation, blogs, Twitter. And I also felt I had to look at quantitative self-representations, which is a kind of self-representation we haven't thought as much about throughout history. This is my Fitbit um, graph. How many of you guys have activity trackers of some kind? Wow, not bad, quite a few of you. So you know about these little gadgets, you wear them, they count how many steps you take each day and you aim to get 10,000 at least. You can get kind of addicted. Um, so this is my graph for three days. There's a Sunday here and you can see I actually went for a run that morning. Wow, that's the big red pillar going up. And then I hung out with the kids. I have young children and so they're moving around all the time. I'm moving around all the time until 7 p.m. Finally, they're in bed. I sit down in the sofa and I don't get up. <laughs> Monday, go to work. Fussing around in the morning, walk into work and then I sit down at my desk and I stay there till I pick the kids up, run around, 7 p.m. I'm in the sofa and that's it. Except Monday night, I looked at my Fitbit. I logged into Fitbit.com. I saw my graphs. I thought, oh my God, that's terrible. I'm just sitting at my desk all day. So I decided to change things. Now, that's part of the point of these wearable devices, activity trackers. Um, they're part of a movement called Quantified Self, where a lot of the aim is actually to track ourselves in order to improve ourselves. And so I looked at this Fitbit graph and I decided to do better the next day. I walked to work, I used my standing desk, I made sure I walked to the printer a lot during the day, and I did all sorts of things. And as you can see, it's a much more balanced day. I didn't even sit down and watch TV that night. I was very good. Now, last year in November, I was at a, a meeting at the Bergen Chamber of Commerce, and they had a meeting about social media marketing. And one of the presenters um, told us about her successful campaign, um, and she finished with these words that stuck with me. The wonderful thing about digital media is that you can measure it. Hmm, I was using my <coughs> Fitbit, I quite enjoyed that. I'd recently started looking back at my web history on Google. I was actually quite interested in measuring myself. Now, the, 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 the social media marketer was talking about um, the marketing metrics that you get on Facebook. You know, if you have a page on Facebook, you can see the demographics. You can see how many people liked each post, what time of day works best for posting, how many people shared your images or your recipes or whatever you're sharing. Um, and you can compare that to your sales figures, so you can measure a lot, certainly. She wasn't really thinking of stuff like Fitbit data. This is personal data, but we're using numbers more and more for our personal data as well. This is um, the output of a life logging app that I used this spring for several weeks. Now this is, um, it comes on your smartphone and what it does is it um, uses GPS and databases of places like Foursquare, um, which has, um, it, so it would know for instance right now that okay, according to your um, geolocation, most likely you're at um, NHH, and that's a business school, so you might be at work or, or you're studying. So this life logging app, it, it creates these lists of everywhere I've been. Um, on June 17th, I woke up at 6.19, it says, or at least that's when my phone first moved, so it figures I probably woke up then. I left the house at 9, I was in transit for 15 minutes, and then I was at Starbucks for three hours, and it thinks that's probably work. So it, it makes all these interpretations of my data. And one of the things that interests me about this is that it's a very quantitative, fixed kind of representation of me, right? It's where I was, and then it interprets it in a way that may or may not be correct. This kind of quantitative self-tracking isn't new at all. Benjamin Franklin did this. Um, he wrote in his autobiography about this wonderful, I think he was ironic, he wrote that he he decided he wanted to become morally perfect. And so what he did was he made a list of virtues, 13 virtues he thought were important. And it was things like silence and resolution and order and frugality and, and, and chastity and um, all sorts of virtues that he felt were important in his life. And he put them down the side of the chart and along the top of the chart, he wrote the day of the week. 
and he gave himself a black mark when he felt that he hadn't lived up to whatever virtue he was aiming for. So if you look at the slide here, you can see that, well, Sunday, he was really not very good at silence. In fact, he really did not do well at silence that whole week. Order, not for Benjamin Franklin. Really good at chastity and frugality, though, so there you go. Now, if you look at the marketing for many of the, the life logging and quantified self type devices, um, you'll see that a lot of them talk about how this is more authentic. This is genuine information because it's automatically tracked. A lot of it's about self-improvement, like John Benjamin Franklin. For instance, there's a little device I could clip to my shirt and it would tell me whether my posture was good and would vibrate every time my posture wasn't good enough, you know. Um, there's this idea, this sort of dream that everything could be completely automatic. Um, our activity trackers can tell us an approximation of how many calories we burn each day, but people also want to automate how many calories you take in. Now, that's not an easy thing to do. There's, um, if you look at Kickstarter, there have been several projects. One of them, um, the Healby, I think it's called, is uh, proposing a bracelet. They got lots of funding for this, by the way, although some people say it's impossible. They keep postponing the release date, but maybe it will happen. It's a bracelet that somehow measures blood flow in a way which they claim can tell how many calories you've eaten during the day, and so it will give you an automatic figure. Um, there's another cup that's coming out um, soon, it's called the Vessel, which it will sense what beverage, what drink you have in that cup. So it can say, oh, you've got a Starbucks mocha latte, whatever, and that has so and so many calories, so and so much sugar, and this amount of caffeine, and then it will draw graphs of how much you drink. Oh, beer again, oh, red wine, maybe there's a bit much of that, honey. Um, so we have this dream of quantifying things, and it's not just ourselves, it's society and it's our children. We bring up our children to expect really detailed tra tracking, actually. If you think about what happens in schools today, um, learning management systems track how children learn, how long they spend on homework, how often they log in. We track their discipline. This is um, the discipline uh, record of a Norwegian high schooler who posted it on his blog. I think he was proud of how bad he'd been. But it shows um, how you know, every infraction is logged with a date and timestamp and an exact description. This is a form of surveillance, really, that we're bringing young people up to expect and take for granted. And we're doing it younger and younger. This is just a sample of wearables for babies that we are now using. Not just wearables. Um, you know those machines where you, the coffee machines you can have at home where you put a pod in for the, to make the coffee? Well, they have them for baby milk, too. Um, so you put your little pod with the powder for the milk in the, pot, in the machine, um, and it synchronizes to uh, an iPhone app, of course, <laughs> to show how many bottles of milk you made, how much milk, you put, it, you put your bottle of milk back in the machine after the baby drank it, and it measures how much is left and so forth. And it synchronizes too with a, an automated scale, a baby scale for weighing your baby every day which is also has an iPhone app and they talk to each other. So you can measure you know, how, much the, how much the baby drinks, how fast the baby grows, and check all these things. Um, obviously, baby formula is much easier to measure than breast milk, so there's some sort of implicit bias in that as well. There's a little uh, vest down the bottom here. This is a Mimo vest. Um, it has a little device you clip in here. Um, and it measures whether the baby's sleeping, what side it's lying on. Um, you see the anklet there is another device which is coming out later this year, which does pretty much the same thing. It measures the baby's breath, heart rate, whether it's restless, whether it's going to wake up soon, all these things. And the promise is that having this on your iPhone, always accessible, is going to make you a calmer parent rather than reaching over and touching your baby to see if it's still breathing. So there's this huge shift. This is just in the last few years. Six years ago, I had a baby and I was upset about, oh my God, she wouldn't sleep. So I, used the, I found a website called the Trixie Tracker and it actually let me do pretty much this with her sleep, except I had to actually click a button on the website when I put the baby down, another when, I, when she finally went to sleep and another when she woke up. And the promise was that by doing this, I'd be able to find the patterns 
So I could work out, you know, will she sleep more through the night if I keep her awake for longer before I put her to bed at night? Or do I need to do something else? In reality, I kept this up for a few months and I found no patterns except as a baby grows a little bit older, it will sleep better. Which, <laughs> you know, I could have probably, my mother could have told me that, I'm sure. <laughs> But there's a shift here because this is technology that we've had in hospitals for a long time and premature babies and babies who are at risk clearly need this. But now we're starting to normalize these things and to use them for everybody. Just the same, you know, if I'm going to wear a Fitbit, <coughs> surely my baby should too. So this is data that's being collected. And I think that there are some things in common between the ways that we have seen photographs and the way we are thinking about data and measurements today. Susan Sontag wrote a wonderful book about photography in the 70s, and she said, photographed images do not seem to be statements about the world so much as pieces of it, miniatures of reality that anyone can make or require. Now, she doesn't, really, she doesn't think photographs really are miniatures of reality. She's arguing that photographs are in indeed representations, right? They're a version of reality, and I think today, we know that about photographs. We use Instagram photos. We retouch our pictures to get rid of the, of the pimples. We um, Photoshop things in. I, if I take a selfie in a swimming pool, obviously I'm going to Photoshop a shark in behind me to make my friends laugh. So I don't think we have this one-to-one -one relationship thinking that a photograph is a miniature of reality anymore. But I think we do think that way about data. When I look at my iPhone health kit app and it tells me that today I walked 3,483 steps, then I figure, oh, that I, I did, right? Um, but in fact, we forget a lot about this data. One of those things is it is a representation. It's a representation not necessarily just of me. When my iPhone says I walked 3,483 steps, what it really means is that the iPhone moved 3,483 times, and maybe I was carrying it, right? There's also uncertainty here. When, when my mother, my mother's a physicist, and she saw the title of my talk, and she just said, Jill, I so deeply disagree with the title of your talk. What do you mean, the things we can't measure? In physics, she said, in measurement science, uncertainty is one of the main principles, and any physicist knows that there's always uncertainty in any measurement, but you can measure anything, she said. Now, my Fitbit graph and all the other graphs that these life logging tools show us, they don't mention that uncertainty. Have you noticed that? It doesn't say round about three and a half thousand steps. It says 3,483 steps. We forget about this uncertainty, and there's something there about the simplification in data where, you know, your measurement scientist, your physicist, your st statistician would be horrified, really, to see the way that we are taking this data as pure truth. Jose van Dijk is a professor of media at the University of Amsterdam, and she has this beautiful term that I think we're going to need to learn and remember in the coming years. She's got the, she calls it dataism. She says dataism is like an ideology. It's like a religion. It's this um, just intense belief that data is truth, right? And it's not just personal data. It's big data as well, of course. Yes, you can find out amazing things by analyzing all the data we have in the world, but is it all the truth? I don't think so. The French don't call it data, they call it digital traces, trace digital. Traces is a beautiful word. It doesn't mean, in French it doesn't mean quite the same as it does in English, actually it's even more evocative. It's closer to the Norwegian word spur, which means tracks that we leave behind us, like footprints in the snow. So our digital traces, or in English, our data, isn't actually a miniature of reality. It's not me, it's a trace that I leave behind me. And we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't confuse the one for the other. So I've talked about dataism, how we trust data maybe too much. I've talked about how data is actually a representation um, and not just the truth. But there's also the way we interpret data. And Johanna Drucker is, um, she's a digital humanist. She's worked with visual media for a very long time. And she has 
this wonderful idea about subjective visualization. So this is a graph that she's shown of, um, if you imagine you've got six nations and you're just doing a simple graph of how many men and women there are in each nation. So you've got two different kinds of shading, one for women, one for men. Um, except, what about transgender people? What about people who maybe don't identify with one gender or identify with both? Or what about people who actually have several nationalities? I'm an Australian citizen, but I've lived in Norway for 40 years. I have American, my husband and children are Americans. Um, do I have to pick? So Johanna Drucker suggests that maybe this would be a more accurate visualization of genders in these countries. And you can see the lines merge and blur. Certainly, you can't like pinpoint this visualization, but it does express the data in a different and perhaps better way. Um, schools in the 20th century were designed, many argue, to teach people to become good factory workers. And that's why the bell rings in the morning, and that's why we learn to sit at tables. This is a cigar factory. Um, Alice Marwick did a beautiful uh, ethnography of the people who started up social media, things like Twitter in the Silicon Valley in the mid-90s. And she argues that social media has metrics built into it, all those likes and shares, all those numbers, because social media is bringing us up to be really good post-industrial citizens. We need to be self-branding, we need to promote ourselves, and we need to um, you know, be entrepreneurial on a personal level. So the metrics in social media and the metrics that we see with the Fitbit and everything where we're trying to improve ourselves fit together in this sense. So back to that meeting at the um, Bergen Chamber of Commerce. Um, I asked, I said, what about the things we can't measure? Because the social media marketer was very, very keen on her measurements. She answered me quickly and easily. She looked at me as if I was a bit dim, actually. She said, you just need to measure again. Measure it all, make adjustments, and measure again. There are some things I think we maybe would agree are difficult to measure. This app is called Spreadsheets, and it's a sex tracker. So it's not just tracking how many steps I walk, it's trying to make a, a, a visualization of the user's sex life. And it measures everything about sex that an iPhone can measure. So it measures um, motion. You put it on the bed, <laughs> and it measures how the bed moves, right? And it interprets that as the frequency of thrust. <laughs> then it figures out how long the movement continues. That's the duration. And it also measures, uses a microphone to measure the decibels. So you get a sense of the loud being created, the sound being created. And of course, that does tell us something about sex. It's got, you know, high score charts and you can share it and so forth, but... <laughs> <laughs> it does tell us something about sex, but it's a really very limited perception of sex. It's a version of sex that we are familiar with, though, from a certain kind of pornography. It's sex, it's about thrust and screaming. But it leaves out a lot about sex. For instance, caresses, foreplay, love, Small things like this. <laughs> now, Anders Branner is a social media expert, a Norwegian expert. He was also speaking at that meeting, and he jumped up to answer my question. He said, you know, if measurements don't give you the whole picture, you just need to measure more, um, put up more weather stations. And he had this beautiful example. Did you know weather stations are really not equally distributed around the world? So in Africa, for example, there aren't very many. Now, they figured out that weather forecasts were not very accurate. They put in more weather stations, got more measurements. Hey presto, better forecasts. This works in many areas. But I'd say it still wouldn't work any, everywhere. You could imagine a lot more sensors for something like this. You could imagine, for instance, um, you could have a heart rate variability monitor. You could, there's a Dutch researchers who are doing have designed wearable devices for detecting your unconscious emotions. You could use a brainwave thing. You can buy these things for um, $300 that will measure brainwaves and say something about whether you're calm or stressed out or happy. Um, you could imagine drawing blood and checking endorphin or other hormones to estimate whether the person's in love or excited. You could imagine all sorts of sensors strapped to or inserted into the body to measure even other things. But even with all those measurements, would they measure 
would they really measure love? Would they measure what is really important to us about these things? So ultimately, I think we live in a world, in a time that is obsessed with numbers, and I think that we're going to see more and more of this um, in the years that come, because with computers today, we're able to really gather data, so much data, and computers are really good at counting things. What we need to do now is figure out what we don't want to count, and we want need to figure out how to understand and interpret the things we can count. Thank you.